Hello everyone, how are we doing? I was asked just before I came on stage to speak loudly because apparently the pickup of my mic uh, needs some help. So if you can hear me at the back, just say yes as loudly as you can. <laughs> okay, you can hear me. That is what I'm going to be speaking about. Is that of interest to any of you? <laughs> well, you know, there is a method by which you can completely and immediately eliminate stress from your life. Let me show you. I'm sorry, that was just too good an opportunity to pass up. It really works. <laughs> there was some research done recently. It was done at Penn State University, and it was a study of teachers, and they found out that nearly half of all teachers report high stress. And not just high stress, but high daily stress. Don't have to tell you that when you have stress, it compromises your health, your sleep, your quality of life, your teaching performance. And it's not just you who's affected. When teachers are highly stressed, students show higher levels of both social adjustment and academic performance. None of this is new to any of you. So my own private survey, how many of you here in the audience are feeling some level of stress right now in your profession. Please raise your hands if you do. Fair number of you, all right. Most teachers, in fact, most persons report that there is more stress in their life than ever before. Have you ever asked yourself why there is stress in your life? Well, I've asked thousands of people these questions in five continents, and obviously I got dozens of answers, but they can be broadly categorized into several distinct categories. So let me go, those, go through those for you. There are eight major factors why persons report they are undergoing stress. Do you like that? cartoon you know, of the teacher meditating. That's one way to help uh, ease stress. So these are the reasons that are generally reported for why people feel stress. The first is financial. You feel under pressure. There are bills to be paid. There are tuition fees to fulfill, mortgages. And somehow or other, it's difficult to make ends meet. So that's reason number one. Reason number two are relationships. Generally with partner, but frequently with friends, colleagues, principals, in-laws, whatever. Relationships are not where you would like them to be. Children. Now, we all know children are bundles of joy. They are supposed to make you fulfilled. How many of your parents in here? A whole bunch of you. Do you notice that while children are indeed sources of joy, sometimes they can contribute to the stress in your life? <laughs> and it begins right from the day you were born. Have you noticed that sometimes babies poop right after you change their diapers? <laughs> and as they grow older, they have a habit of falling in love with the most unsuitable persons <laughs> and dropping out rather than going to law school. They do stuff like that. For teachers, there's a double whammy because not only do teachers have issues with their own children. They also have issues with other people's children. So it's a double whammy. Carrier. 
You want to be someplace in your career and you feel you're not making the progress that you would like. Health. You want to run the iron, you want to do the iron man, you want to run the marathon, but your doctor informs you that you have this dread condition for which there may or may not be a remedy. Your health, the health of people around you, that is a major stressor. Then there is the big external stuff. And there's a lot of this big external stuff going on right now. I'm in, I, I live in the United States, and I must tell you that I get up every day and I'm almost scared to read the headlines. Okay. Then there is the overwork thing. There's too much to do and not enough time to do it all. And last but not least is the general sense of dissatisfaction that you are not where you would like to be. You know, I even know, I even know persons who are stressed out because their meditation practice is not going as well as they would like it to be. <laughs> so those, in my experience, are the categories that cause the most stress to persons. Have I covered all of that for you? Right? Actually, all of them are wrong. And if you think that you feel stressed because of one or more of these factors, I'd like to ask you to think again. Because there is only one reason that you feel stress. Let me repeat that. There is one and only one reason you feel stress. And the reason you feel stress is because you have a very rigid idea of how the universe should be and the universe is not playing ball with you. Think about that. As long as you are in the human predicament, stuff will happen. There will be serious illness and death. There will be career reverses. There will be financial setbacks. There will be business problems. It's part of the human predicament. You will deal with them as appropriate, but you do not have to feel stress. You feel stress because you have a very, very rigid idea of this is the way it should be. And the universe, have any of you noticed the universe doesn't pay a lot of regard to how you would like things to be? Failure to accept that is what causes stress in your life. Now, you probably haven't thought about it this way, but I now invite you to think about it. Your entire life has been an unending quest to have control. You want to know what's hap going to happen tomorrow. You want to know what's going to happen the day after tomorrow. You want to know how your charges are going to behave. You want to know how your spouse is going to be. You want to know how your career is going to turn out. Right? Not only do you want to know, but you're determined to make it happen the way you would like it to. And in your head, you have this model. You know, I'm here, and I want to be there, and if I do this, this, and this, I'm going to go from here to there. Sometimes you succeed. Sometimes you don't. I'm going to say more about this a little bit later. But what I want you to recognize right now is that in your entire life, in all of the goals that you set, in all of the plans that you make, is this inbuilt thing. I want to have control. I want to know where I'm going to be. And darn it, I'm going to make it so. Okay? So your entire life 
is an unending quest for control. So I have something I want to share with you. You do not have control. Not only do you not have control, but you never had control. And here is the good news. You never will have control. It's an illusion. What you have is the illusion of control. And this is important, so let me share with you how it comes about. A lot of times in your life you have said, gee, you know, I'm here and I want to go there, and if I work really hard, then I'm going to get there. And it works. Sometimes it works, even many times it works. So you say, see, you know, I wanted to get there and I did it. I did it. In reality, you didn't do it. You just got lucky. Be very grateful for that. Because you succeeded, or because you think you succeeded, because of your efforts, you say, yes, you know, I can do it. I can do anything I want. In fact, probably that's what you impress upon many of your charges. In reality, you got lucky, but this thing that many times you did, quote, succeed, gives you the notion that you can do it again and again. And by the way, that's not a bad thing to have. But it is a bad thing to think that you do have control because every once in a while you'll find you did it and it didn't work. And when you have the illusion of control and it breaks down, that's when you go to pieces. That when, that's when the stress becomes unbearable. That's where you break down. So recognize that you should try, you should make every attempt you can to get to where you want, and I'll be talking more about this later. But don't kid yourself that you have control. That's extremely important. Let me tell you about a novel that I read recently, and it's a really, really neat novel, okay? So here's what happened. There was a king and a queen, and they were not particularly beloved by the population. The population was making demands that uh, they were resisting, and one day they decided, okay, maybe we will accede to some of the demands. But the restive population didn't know that this is what they planned. And one day they were going to visit a distant part of the kingdom. And, and a rebel group decided that they were going to assassinate the king and the queen. And they really wanted to have control of the process, right? So they decided that they were going to send not one, not two, not three, but six separate assassins to make sure they really bumped off the king and the queen. And of course, the visit was publicized, and the route the king and the queen were going to take was publicized. So the six assassins positioned themselves along the route, and uh, the leader was pretty sure that, you know, with six people, we definitely are going to get the king and the queen. What happened is that as the motorcade ran around, it somehow zipped past assassins number one and two, and assassin number three threw a bomb. And that bomb hit, the king and the queen were running, riding in an open car, and that bomb hit the folded down roof of the car, bumped into the road, and blew up the car behind, which carried the bodyguards of the king and queen. So that, of course, tipped off the driver of the royal limousine that something was happening, and he stepped on the gas, and he zipped by so fast that assassins four, five, and six couldn't do anything. So the king and the queen went to the town hall, and they were really, really angry at the governor of the province, and they ticked him off. And the queen, who was somewhat of a control freak, decided that she was then going to control what happened from that point on. And she said, we're going to scrap the speech. 
and we're going to go right back to the capital because obviously this is unsafe. So they decided they were going back to the capital and the only place they were going to stop why was at the military hospital so they could uh, visit the persons who had uh, been wounded. Some had died, but some were wounded. They were hospital. We'd visit the guards who were in hospital and then we'd go right back. But unfortunately, the governor was quite uh, shaken by the dressing down he had received, and he forgot to tell the driver that the route had been changed. So the driver went off merrily on the old route until the governor recognized that there was an error, and he said, hey, that's not where we're going. We're going to the military hospital. So he had to stop and reverse. And as he was stopping and reversing, assassin number five, who happened to be in a coffee house, came out and he saw the king and the queen just a dozen feet away, and he took out his revolver and shot at both of them. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with handguns, but if you've got a handgun and you're taking a pot shot at someone who's 20 feet away, it's very difficult for you to actually hit the person you're aiming at. He was only able to lose two shots, and one of them hit the king on the neck, and the other caught the queen in the stomach, and both of them died within minutes. And then, of course, he was apprehended. Now, isn't that a wonderful novel? Shows all of these people who had or wanted to have control, and it didn't work. Well, that was no novel. The king was Archduke Ferdinand, the queen was Sophie, the, third, the fifth assassin was Gavrilo Princip, and that, of course, gave us I repeat, you do not have control, you never had control, you never will have control. That's true in world affairs, we're seeing that very clearly now, and it's true in your personal life. So when you don't have control, how can you live the life that I pointed out to you? And let me tell you, by the way, the vision that I have for each one of you. The vision I have for you is that you get up in the morning and your blood is singing at the thought of being who you are and doing what you do. That as you go through the day, you come radiantly alive. That you could go to your niece in involuntary gratitude at the tremendous good fortune that's been bestowed on you. What I'm talking about is not a pipe dream, it is achievable. Not only is it achievable, it is achievable by you. And I'm going to share with you how you can begin the process of getting there. So there are a number of building blocks in that, so let me share them with you. The first one is something called mental chatter. Now, mental chatter is an internal monologue that you have going on in your head all the time. It begins when you get up in the morning, is with you right through the day, is with you right now when you should be listening to my chatter instead of your chatter. But already in the 15 or so minutes I've been speaking, how many of you have gone elsewhere? What am I going to do for dinner? You know, right? I rest my case. Mental chatter has always been with you. It's like an unwelcome relative who's shown up and you can't throw him out. So what do you do? You live your life in spite of your mental chatter. You try to ignore it. You try to suppress it. You work around it. And you live your life. You ignore your mental chatter, and that's a huge, huge, huge mistake. And the reason it's a huge mistake is, though you do not recognize it, you construct your life with your mental chatter. You think you live in a real world. You don't. You live in a construct. And you made that construct with your mental chatter and your mental models, which is a concept I'm going to come to in just a couple of minutes. It's as if you're all living in the matrix. Did any of you see the matrix, the original matrix? Whole bunch of you did. Well, you're all living in the matrix. The only difference is this is not a matrix constructed by an alien civilization out to enslave you. It is something that you constructed yourself using your mental chatter and your mental models. 
A mental model is a notion that you have that this is the way the world works. And you have dozens of models, possibly hundreds of models. Of some place, right? Mic back? All right, yes. You've got a model for how do I find a job, how do I get ahead in my job, how do I become a more effective teacher, how do I find a person to marry, how do I improve marriage. You've got dozens of models, possibly hundreds of models. Mike's gone off again, right? Come back. You've got dozens of models, possibly hundreds of models. Some of these models may be in conflict with each other, and you may or may not be aware of the conflicts. There's no problem with having mental models. Mental models are wonderful devices. They help you make sense of unstructured situations. They save you time. The problem is not that you have mental models. The problem is that you don't recognize that you have mental models. You think this is the way the world works. But this is not the way the world works. This is your model of this is the way the world works. And the more you believe in your model, the more evidence you seem to get that this in fact is the way the world works. And very soon you build a silo around yourself that's so thick you can't break out. Now, all of this seems abstract, so let me show you how this plays out in practice. So I'm going to give you an example, and what I would like you to do as you listen to me is don't just listen to me. Put yourself in the situation that I am describing. Now, here's the deal. You're going to an important meeting. Got it? You're going to an important meeting, and you're running late and you are driving. All right, you're going to an important meeting, you're running late, you're driving, and you are stuck in a traffic jam. Do you have traffic jams in Prague? <laughs> well, imagine that you're in California. Okay? So, you're going to an important meeting, you're running late, you're stuck in a traffic jam, and not just a run-of-the-mill traffic jam, but the mother of all traffic jams. <laughs> it's a really, really, really hot day. Let's assume that the thermometer is stuck at 40 degrees, and those of you who come from America, that's about 105 degrees and the air conditioning in your car has courteously broken down. <laughs> okay, now really, put yourself in that situation. You're going to an important meeting, you're running late, you're stuck in a massive traffic jam, it's really hot, you have no air conditioning, and suddenly a car comes in front of you and almost causes an accident. And then he cuts in front of another car in front of you and almost causes a second accident. What are your feelings towards the driver of that car? Would it be fair to say that loving kindness is not it? <laughs> it would be fair to say that loving kindness is not it. So maybe a good thing that you do not have a firearm in the car, right? You're really, really, really pissed off at the driver of that car. So, let me now share some information about the driver of that car. He has just received some bad news. His son was involved in a very serious accident and has to be operated on immediately. And he is desperately trying to get to the hospital, and he has no knowledge of whether or not he will ever see his son 
alive again. Got that? Now, what happens when I share that information with you? Can you feel your rage, your anger dissipate, leaving you with compassion for a fellow human being in a, an unfortunate situation? Yes? Okay, so you can feel your anger dissipate. Now, here's the thing. You don't really know whether the guy who cut you off was an inconsiderate jerk or a distraught father, correct? But now that I have shared this information with you, here's what you're going to do. You're going to hire a private detective to look into the matter and report back to you. And if the private detective reports back to you that the guy was an inconsiderate jerk, you'll be really pissed off. But if he reports back to you that the guy was a distraught father, you will feel great compassion. But until you know for sure, you're going to remain neutral. I notice a number of you are laughing. I take that to signify that, no, you're not going to hire a private detective to look into the matter, right? In fact, I'm willing to bet that none of the good people in this room will hire a private detective to look into the matter. But if you don't hire a private detective to look into the matter and report back to you, you're never going to know whether or not the guy who cut you off was an inconsiderate jerk or a distraught father, right? But the more important point is, it really doesn't matter. You have the option of deciding which is the emotional domain you are going to occupy. Let me repeat that. You have the option of deciding which is the emotional domain you are going to occupy. In all likelihood, until I just pointed it out to you, you did not even recognize that, number one, you had a choice, and number two, you utilized that choice. You made a decision. In all likelihood, it happened so fast, you didn't even recognize that. But now that I'm explicitly drawing it to your attention, do you recognize that you had a choice and you made the choice? This is important for the following reason. You face such a juncture in your life dozens of times every day. Let me repeat that. You face such a junction in your life dozens of times every day. And in the vast majority of these instances, you choose to occupy a space where you're angry, depressed, dejected, rejected, and you do not even recognize that you had a choice and you exercise the choice. And the reason you do that is because of the mental chatter you entertain and the mental models that you hold. That's how important mental chatter and mental models are. Now, Every one of us at some juncture, and the two most important turning points are your birthday and New Year's Day, go something like this. From now on, things are going to be different. I'm going to stop smoking, eat healthy, quit procrastinating. And if you've done that, how long does it last? You know, there's a reason that exercise clubs sign up many, many times more members than they can handle in December. They know that in January, there will be plenty of room on the treadmill sign-up sheets. Because most of us try to bring about profound behavioral change by an effort of will. Darn it, I 
am going to stop smoking. I am going to pass on dessert. Every time you try to bring about behavioral change by an act of will, you're doing violence to yourself. Odds are pretty good you won't succeed, but even if you exercise a lot of will and you do succeed, they will probably be byproducts that you're not very happy about. For example, you stop smoking cold turkey, you eat too much, you put on weight. There is a better way. And this is a better way that I've been teaching in my programs for dozens of years. It absolutely works. And the better way is the following. Don't try to bring about behavioral change by an effort of will, but instead examine your mental models. And as you make changes in your mental models, you see the world differently. You become a different person. Hello, Mike back here. And as you become a different person, your behavior change happens automatically as a byproduct. It is a much better, a far superior method. And I'm going to share that with you, or many of the components of that with you today. First, there is something called a mental screensaver. And this is something that I advocate for all of you. Think about some time in your life when things were going swimmingly well. You were on top of the world, you were excited, you had a sense of purpose, your work was going smoothly. Think about in great detail, recreate it in your mind. Where were you? What was happening? Who else was involved? How did you feel? Impress it upon your memory. Make it a movie. And every time you are you have a break in your life, and we all have breaks in our life. Uh, like let's say you're driving and you hit a red light, you've got maybe 15, 20 seconds, or you're taking a subway or the underground and you, know, you miss one, so you've got maybe five minutes before the next one comes out, or someone cancels an appointment, so you've got a half hour. There are many times in our life when we have these breaks. Where does your mind go during these breaks? Don't go to the headlines of the papers. Don't go into, oh my God, I have too much to do and not enough work, not enough time to get it all. Instead, pull up your mental screensaver and replay it. Do it consciously and deliberately. What I generally advise in my programs is for persons to have three or four such mental screensavers in different areas of their life. So one could be in your professional life, one could be with your family, one could be with your friends. Have three or four or more of these mental screensavers, create each one in detail, and play it over in your mind. Okay, it's a very powerful method. Then there is appreciation and gratitude. Uh, by the way, how many of you here have a problem going to sleep? Anybody? Raise your hands if you can. Well, I'm going to share with you an exercise which has a 100% record of solving this particular problem. I don't mean 80, I don't mean 90, I mean really 100%. Here's what you do. All of us spend a disproportionate amount of our emotional energy on the two, three, or four things that are wrong in our lives. More precisely, we spend a disproportionate amount of en emotional energy on the two, three, or four things that we have arbitrarily decided are bad in our life and we totally ignore the 40, 50, 60, 200 things which are pretty darn good about our lives. Think about it, every single person in this room is incredibly, extraordinarily privileged. Think about it, seriously. 
Do any of you have to think about whether you're going to have lunch today? Do you have to think about, do I have a bed to sleep in? Do I have a roof over my head? Can I go from place A to place B with reasonable certainty that I'm not going to get blown up? You do recognize that every single one of the things that I have mentioned is a big deal in many parts of the world right now, right? So you're not just privileged, you're incredibly privileged. But guess what? Though you do recognize it intellectually when I point it out, in your day-to-day -day life as you go about it, you don't feel incredibly privileged. You feel stressed out. The reason is, as I said before, we spend a disproportionate amount of our time pouring our emotional energy and attention on the two, three, or four things that we have arbitrarily decided are wrong with our lives, and we have completely ignored the 40, 50, 200 things, which are pretty darn good. Flip this around. Consciously think about the many things in your life that are really very good. Think about how many people would switch places with you in a heartbeat. Now, this is not an intellectual exercise. This is an experiential exercise. So you can't go around making a checklist and saying, good health, check, roof overhead, check, food to eat, check. It doesn't work that way. You have to actually experience the feeling of being appreciative, you can't think it, okay? And if you are a left-brain type A individual, and I'll wager that this room is full of left-brain type A individual, it'll take some time before you can get from thinking to feeling. But persist until you do. So here's what you need to do. Five minutes before you go to bed, actually start doing things which will bring about this feeling of appreciation and gratitude. The biggest challenge people had is, Professor Rao, I started doing this exercise and I could never finish it because I fell asleep. If that happens, sit up in bed or stand up until you do it, and then lie down. When you get up in the morning, don't go immediately to the space of, there's too much to do and I don't have enough time to do it all. Go back to this feeling of appreciation and gratitude. And many times during the day, consciously sit down and let appreciation and gratitude well up. As with all things, the more you practice it, the better you'll get at it, and the more you'll benefit. But if you do it last thing at night and again first thing in the morning, one problem that will be solved is you can't go to sleep. All right? Be other-centered. Have all of you heard about Galileo? He got into a spot of trouble a few centuries ago. Anybody remember why he got into a spot of trouble? He got into a spot of trouble because he hypothesized that perhaps the sun does not move around the earth. Perhaps the earth moves around the sun. Well, every single one of you is convinced that Galileo got it wrong. The earth does not move around the sun it revolves around you personally, and you're all convinced about it. Now, you are laughing, but I'm being entirely serious, and I invite you to think along with me. Is it or is it not true that no matter what happens, you quickly bring it down to what's the impact on me? Think about that. No matter what happens, you have a habit of thinking, what's the impact on me? Your spouse gets a great job offer. Your reaction, how is this going to affect our relationship? 
Your daughter drops out of high school to begin an in-depth exploration of controlled substances. <laughs> say, gee, what will they say about my parenting? Dr. Rao had a heart attack. This program is canceled. Gee, I can catch up on my email. No matter what happens, we have a habit of bringing it down to what's the impact on me. We live in a me-centered universe. Now, here's what I want to share with you about living in a me-centered universe. If that is where you spend the vast majority of your time, if that is where you preponderantly live, then you are going to live by and, loss, by and large a mediocre existence punctuated with flashes of pleasure. That's just the way it works. The only way you're going to be able to burst out of that into the vision laid out of you is to discover a cause a cause which is bigger than you are and which brings a greater good to a greater community. And you have tremendous flexibility in defining both the greater good and the greater community. But it's only if you can do that that you will be able to live a life such as I laid out for you before. Ancient England, there was a great cathedral being built and the architect was going to the scene of the construction, and he came across three people who were doing exactly the same thing. There was a big block of stone, and they put a smaller block of stone on top of the big block of stone and beating it with a hammer till it broke. And he asked the first person, what are you doing? And the person said, can't you see? I'm breaking rocks. Well, why are you doing it? I'm doing it because I get paid a hip and off a day. And the second person said, I'm helping build the wall behind me. And the third person said, I'm helping build a great cathedral. And when it is done, people are going to come from all over the world. And they will be inspired. And I will have had a small role in this. And the third person was the only one who recognized the architect. And he said, truth be told, I don't like doing this. It is back-breaking work, and I can get better wages for less effort, and I'm only doing that because I want to learn, will you teach me to build a cathedral? And 20 years from that day, the guy who was breaking stones was dead. He no longer had enough strength to swing the hammer, and he starved. And the guy who was building the wall behind him was living a life of desperate poverty, but the guy who was helping build a cathedral, he was on his way to building his first cathedral. This is a choice that every one of you has every day. You can get up in the morning and you go to work and you can either build a or you can break rocks. I cannot define for you the cathedral that you will build. You are the only person who can do that. But I can tell you that if you do not define the cathedral that you're going to build, then you're breaking rocks and you will live essentially a mediocre, meaningless existence. And this works for anyone. I remember I was conducting a conference for the senior executives of a Fortune 25 company. Uh, must have been about 50 people in the room. Every single one of them ran a country. Some of them ran multiple countries. The company had introduced a new product which hadn't quite failed, but sales were below expectation. There was a restructuring underway as a result of which of the people in the room, some of them would not be there in the same conference the next year, and the only thing they didn't know is which of them would not be there. So a typical big company scenario, you know, a lot of tension, <clears throat> and I asked everybody to think about, what do you do? And a bunch of answers came up. You know, the new product has not been introduced in my region, and I want to make sure that sales are above global average. Or we just made an acquisition in my country, and I want to make sure that integration of the acquisition goes smoothly. 
And I said, if that is why you get up in the morning, you are either burnt out or you're heading towards burnout. Look at this man. He's young. He's in his 50s. He had a heart attack. And it's the stent that you manufacture that give him his life back. Here's this beautiful young girl, went through the windshield in a automobile accident, and it is the sutures that you manufacture that gave her her looks back. Go meet the man in the hospital, go talk to the girl and meet her family. See how important they are in the ecology of the small social circle. That is why you get up in the morning. And if that is why you get up in the morning, then all of the problems you're facing are minor bumps in the road. But if that's not why you get up in the morning, any one of them can be a major derailment. And what I was surprised about is how many of them came up afterwards to say, Dr. Rao, we really needed to hear that. It's so important and so easy to forget. So once again, as you're going through your life, remember, only you can define what is the cathedral you're building, but it is hugely important that you define it and then you continue to build it because if you are breaking rocks, you're going to live a mediocre, meaningless existence. Now this is a very powerful tool that I'm going to share with you. There is something that you do and you do it multiple times every day, and it is hugely deleterious to your well-being and existence, but you do it anyway. Now, what is this thing that you do multiple times every day that you don't know is having a negative effect, effect upon your life? It is a habit we all have of sticking a label on whatever happens to us. And the two labels that I'm particularly interested in are the good thing, bad thing label. Now think about that. No matter what happens to you, in your head, you immediately classify it as either good or bad. Nothing is neutral. You know, it's either slightly good or slightly bad. And most of us tend to use the bad thing label three to ten times as often as a good thing label. Your spouse calls up and tells you that your in-laws are coming for dinner. This is bad. They may stay for the weekend. This is really bad. Think about it. No matter what happens, don't you stick a good thing or a bad thing label on it immediately? Here's something for you to think about. No matter what happens, no matter what the event is, an event does not cause suffering. Let's assume you, you get fired. You now no longer have a job. But the moment you go, oh my God, I, fi I got fired. How do I pay my mortgage? My son's tuition is due. This is terrible. And the moment you say this is terrible, at that instant, suffering begins. Suffering doesn't begin when something happens. Suffering begins the instant you decide that what happened is terrible, unbearable, unfortunate, and you cannot tolerate it. At that instant, suffering begins. Think about that. True, false? This is important, so I'm going to pause. So let me tell you a story. This is a story, there are many versions of the story, but I like the one that I'm about to share with you. It comes from the Sufi tradition. <clears throat> and it talks about a man and his son, and they lived in a beautiful valley, and they were very happy, but they were also dirt poor. And the man decided that he was going to become rich. He no longer wanted to be poor. And he decided the way he was going to be rich was by breeding horses. So he bought a stallion. Didn't have enough money to buy a stallion, so he borrowed heavily from the neighbors. And the very day he bought the stallion, it kicked the top bar loose from the paddock in which he had housed it and escaped. 
and all the neighbors came around him and said, you thought you were going to become a rich man, but your stallion has run away, and you still owe us money, you are screwed. And he shrugged his shoulders and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows. That stallion fell in with a group of wild horses that were grazing close to the man's house, and he was able to entice them back into the paddock, which he had repaired, so escape was no longer possible. So all of a sudden, he now had the stallion back, plus about a dozen wild horses, which by the standards of that village made him a wealthy man. And all the neighbors came around and said, we thought you were destitute, but fortune has smiled upon you. How fortunate you are. And he shrugged his shoulder and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows. The man and his son started to break the horses so they could sell them on the market. And one of the horses threw the man's son and stomped on his leg. And it broke. And it healed crooked. And all the neighbors came around commiserating. He was such a fine young lad, and now he'll never be able to find a girl to marry him. And the man shrugged his shoulder and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows? That summer, the king of the country declared war on a neighboring country, and press gangs moved through the villages, rounding up all the able-bodied young men to serve in the army. But this man's son was spared because he had a crooked leg. And the neighbors had tears in their eyes as they came around and said, we don't know if we will ever see our sons again, but you still have your son, how fortunate you are. And he shrugged his shoulders and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows? And it goes on like that forever. And I invite you to think about something. Has anything ever happened in your life that at the time it happened, you thought, this is terrible? But looking back upon it now with the perspective of time and maybe greater wisdom, you can say, hey, that was actually a good thing. Yes? I see a number of heads nodding. So something happened to you in your life that at the time it happened you thought was terrible, but now you can look back and say, hey, that was actually pretty good. So if something like that happened to you in the past, is there any possibility that what you are today about to label bad could in X years turn out to be pretty good? Is there the slightest possibility? If there is the slightest possibility of that happening, why are you in a hurry to label it bad? Think about it. Why are you in a hurry to label it bad? And if you then ask yourself the next question, is there anything that I can do to actually make it a good thing? And all of a sudden, courses and avenues of action will open up to you that you probably never con even conceived before. This is a method and an exercise which will make you in incredibly resilient. And if you get in the habit of using it regularly, so it's no longer a habit, but part of this is who I am, you will find that people will look up to you because no matter what happens, nothing faces you. Let me give you two examples. I was teaching at London Business School, and many of my students from London Business School went on to the city of London, which is the English equivalent of Wall Street. And when the financial crisis hit, one of them was fired. And he was really, really, really annoyed. He was more annoyed at the fact that there were persons he considered turkeys in his department who didn't get laid off, but he did. But, you know, he'd taken my program and he, you know, got over it in a day and he said, I never really liked the job anyway. And then he went out, took a vacation, then he bought a business and is trying to make that run. But six months later, the financial crisis got worse and the entire department was laid off. He was one of the early persons laid off, so you got a very, very generous severance package. Those who got laid off later got a bare bones package. So he was actually lucky to have been fired when he was. I'll give you another example. So there was this guy who was a very strong swimmer, and he wanted to do well in a particular meet. And a few months before the meet, he slipped on a patch of ice and broke his wrist. This is a bad thing, right? He certainly thought so. 
He thought his career, professional career, had ended. But his coach told him to get on with it, so he did. But for weeks and weeks, the only thing that he could do was be by the side of the pool kicking while his teammates were practicing furiously. Then we fast forward to the actual meet. And in one of the most important events of the meet, his opponent swam the race of his life. And he was behind at the halfway mark, and he should have lost that race. But he hung in there, and he managed to win that race by one one hundredth of a second. It was one of the closest finishes in the history of athletic competition. And in fact, they had to go to the fast frame-by-frame -frame photographs to show that he had touched the wall a whisker before his inspired opponents. But those photos showed something else. At the finish, his legs were still kicking. His opponent's legs were trailing. The swimmer was Michael Phelps. The race was the 100-meter butterfly at the Beijing Olympics. That's what gave him his seventh gold medal. And without it, he would never have gotten eight gold medals in a single Olympics to create an all-time record. Michael always had a killer kick, but those weeks and weeks of kicking by the side of the pool gave him muscles he never had before. So arguably, a case can be made that, athletically speaking, the best thing that ever happened to him is he broke his list. So once again, something happened to you, you're about to label it bad, think, is there any possible way by which this could actually turn out to be a good thing? And then, is there anything I can do to make it so? And you'll be surprised at how many times you'll be able to skate off what would otherwise have led to dejection or depression. This is another very powerful exercise. Remember I talked to you earlier about mental chatter? A great deal of the time when you suffer, you suffer not because of what you're doing, but because of your mental chatter. How many of you are stuck in a job you don't particularly like? How many of you have a boss you find toxic? In every case, you have in the back of your mind something going on. This is terrible. Why is this happening to me? I don't want to do this. I deserve better. Think about that. It's just a thought in your head. And if you can get to the point where you observe it and recognize that it is a thought in your head, and pour all of your attention into what it is you have to do, as opposed to thinking about how much you don't want to do it, you'll find that it becomes bearable and sometimes even enjoyable. I mentioned this in passing before, but I'm going to describe it in greater detail now. We're all taught from a very young age to set goals for ourselves. Teachers, in particular, encourage their students to set goals. You were told to set goals by parents, teachers, coaches, colleagues, companies. All of the companies that I work with encourage goal setting for their executives. In fact, many of the companies no longer set goals, they set stretch goals. Now, I invite you to think about your life. In your life, many times you have set goals for yourself. Some of the times you have succeeded in meeting them. Some of the time you haven't. Correct? So what happens is we go through life, we set goals for ourselves. Sometimes we succeed, sometimes we don't. And we live our lives according to, I set a goal for myself, I succeeded, life's a blast. Or I set a goal, I did not reach it, I failed. Life sucks. You set yourself up, so you go on a sinusoidal curve, oscillating between elation and despair, and we tend to spend more time at the despair end of the spectrum. It's a lousy way to live life. 
I'm going to suggest something different. Goals are very important, but they're very important because they give you direction. Once the direction has been set, forget about the goals. Don't give it a thought. Instead, pour all of your emotional energy into what are the actions that I can take that will help me get to my goal. Remember, actions are more under your control than the outcome. We talked earlier about control. The outcome is beyond your control. The assassins wanted to get Prince, uh, okay, Prince Ferdinand before uh, in the motorcade and they didn't succeed. Ferdinand and Queen Sophie wanted to get back to the capital because Sarajevo was too dangerous and she did not succeed. Brexit happened, Trump became president. Outcomes are beyond your control. What is under your control, at least to some extent, are what are the activities that you undertake. So put all of your emotional energy into the activity and not on the goal. And when you do that, two things happen. Number one, you actually start enjoying the journey. Most of the time, we're so focused on the destination that we forget the journey is the only thing we have. The destination is a mirage. You get there, and then you're off somewhere else. You know, people dream of climbing Mount Everest. Do you know how much time you spend? Mike gone again? Yeah. Do you know how much time you spend atop of Mount Everest? A few minutes. You know, you get up there, your buddy takes a picture, your buddy gets up there, you take a picture, and then you're on your way down, and you hope you don't get killed. So if you're going to climb Mount Everest, you better enjoy the weeks and weeks of acclimatization, of getting to base one, base two, right? It's exactly the same one, same way in life. By all means, set a goal, but recognize the importance of the goal is that it sets direction. And once the direction has been set, Disengage from the goal, put all your emotional energy into what are the activities that you have to undertake and give that your best. And paradoxically, the more you disengage from the, glo from the uh, goal, the higher the probability that you will actually achieve it. It's paradoxical but true. How many of you have ever taken a course in negotiation? Anybody? If ever you've taken a course in negotiation, you will recognize that you're never in a stronger position than when you're genuinely prepared to walk away. Think about that, correct? Works the same way in life. So yes, goals are important. By all means, set goals. But having set a goal, do not obsess about it. Instead, pour all of your emotional energy into what are the activities that I have to undertake to reach my goal. And you'll find that you not only enjoy the journey, but the probability of you reaching the goal goes up exponentially. This one needs no explanation. Laugh. My recommendation is everyone here should read at least one book by P.J. Woodhouse a month. If any of you are not familiar with P.J. Woodhouse, he's an English humorist and rib-ticklingly funny. Now this is another powerful technique I'm going to share with you. Comes from Shakespeare. And this one comes in particular from Julius Caesar. So if you're familiar with Julius Caesar, what happened is Brutus and the conspirators decided they were going to assassinate Julius Caesar because they wanted to run Rome. And they thought that if they did, then they could collectively rule Rome. But the assassins did not recognize, remember, nothing is under your control, and they did not foresee two things happening. Number one, Mark Antony got up and gave his famous friends, Romans, countrymen speech, and that turned the population against the assassins. And then Octavian Caesar got together a legion and came after them. And they never expected that. So they scattered, and Octavian Caesar came after them anyway. And then 
Before they met at the Battle of Philippi, Cassius came up to Brutus to ask him for something, and Brutus, you must recognize, had already started regretting his role in the assassination of Julius Caesar, because when Julius Caesar said, et tu, Brut, it really struck home. So Brutus declined Cassius' request, and then he said, and whether we shall meet again, I know not. Therefore, our everlasting farewell take. Forever and forever farewell, Cassius. If we should meet again, we shall smile. If not, why then this parting was well made? Now think about that. Many of you have come here from distant countries, you have left spouses, you have left children. Is there any guarantee that you will see them again? Think about it. And if each time you part, you have in the back of your mind, and whether we shall meet again, I know not, what will that do to your presence at that time? What happens with all of the petty irritations that you carry around with you. If you have that in the back of your mind as a consciousness, I really don't know if I will see you again, so every parting is the last one. It completely transforms your life. Now understand it is extraordinarily difficult, maybe even impossible, to maintain that level of consciousness all of the time. So don't try. But it is possible to maintain it some of the time. So consciously pick, you know, for the next hour, whoever I meet, I'm going to do it with that consciousness. And as you do it, you'll find that it becomes more and more habitual. You'll do it more and more of the time. Your relationships will improve. Your life literally will be transformed. And you can say thank you to Shakespeare. This is another powerful model. Einstein said, you know, we revere Einstein because he was a great scientist. He discovered the theory of relativity. He discovered the photoelectric effect, which is why he got the Nobel Prize, by the way. He didn't get the Nobel for the theory of relativity. He got it because he dis discovered the photoelectric effect. But Einstein said, the most important question you're ever going to ask yourself is, is the universe friendly? Most of us believe that the universe is indifferent to us. Here I am doing my thing, here's the universe doing its thing, and the universe doesn't know I exist and couldn't care less. Some of the time, the universe seems to be acting with me. Some of the time, it seems to be acting against me. But most of the time, it's simply random. And the universe neither knows about me nor cares about me. That's the world in which we live. Correct? But what if the universe was not indifferent towards you? What if the universe was not only aware of you, but was friendlyly disposed towards you. Think about that. Sometimes the universe does things which you perceive as distinctly unfriendly. But supposing it wasn't really. It's a little bit like you're a small child and what you want is a tub of ice cream and what your parents give you are fruit and vegetables and you don't want fruits and vegetables, you want a tub of ice cream. The universe gives you a fruit and vegetables, you're not happy about it. But it's only much later when you have a different level of uh, consciousness that you can say, thank God my parents gave me fruit and vegetables, right? What if the universe was like that? Yes, it gives you stuff that you don't necessarily want, but what if that was exactly what you needed? What if? Can I prove the universe is benevolent? Of course not. But can you prove the universe is not benevolent? 
Of course not. So regardless of whether or not the universe is benevolent, if you believed the universe was benevolent, your life would improve significantly. And there is a simple method for deciding. Simple method, oh, by the way, just because you recognize that a model is intellectually superior doesn't necessarily mean you can adopt it. But there is a way in which you can start inculcating this, and that is actively start looking for occasions when the universe seems to be acting with you. And you know something? The more you look, the more evidence you will find. Okay? All right. Now I am going to play a short video clip, and let me give you a little example, a little history behind that. This comes from uh, the film Gandhi. And Gandhi had an incredible ability to do something. And I, what it is that he did, I'm going to tell you later. But this has to do with the colonial struggle in India. And one of the things that he did is uh, the British decided, basically, that salt would be taxed. And Indians would no longer be allowed to make salt as they did before but salt would be a royal monopoly and you'd have to pay tax on it. And of course, in a tropical country, that's a big deal because salt is the long, not, not just a flavor, it's also a preservative in a hot tropical country. So Gandhi decided that he was going to uh, not stand for this, so he led a protest march. And uh, you know, this was a Dundee salt march. And they went and made salt. You know, Basically, there was a salt protest. And then he was going to march on a factory which manufactured salt. And uh, what you're going to see is what happened at that time. So I want you to watch it. It's a somewhat powerful uh, clip. So I want you to watch it, and then I'll tell you uh, how it relates to what we're talking about. So what kind of leadership qualities should exist in an individual that he, get, that he can persuade large numbers of people to behave in the manner that you just did. Gandhi had an incredible, evident, <coughs> incredible ability to bring out the dog in you. Let me explain what I mean. This comes from the Native American tradition, and it talked about a young brave who was about to grow up and take his place among the elders of the tribe. And as a final rite of passage, he had to have a meeting with the medicine man. And the medicine man told him, here is this dog, kind, loving, intelligent, faithful, and here is this wolf malvolent, vicious, ready to strike at and kill anything. And the dog and the wolf are fighting. And the dog and the wolf are both inside you. And the young brave asked, which one is going to win? Said, Whichever one you feed. Now think about that. Inside each one of us, are altruistic, let's help our fellow man and make the world a better place impulses. And inside each of us, there are a, let me get everything I can for myself and the devil take the hindmost impulses. And they're always at war with each other. Don't make the mistake of thinking you're only going to feed the dog and starve the wolf, it ain't going to happen. The best that you can hope for is going to feed the dog a little bit more than you feed the wolf. But as you feed the dog more, it becomes stronger. And it is your responsibility not only to feed the dog in yourself, but also to identify and feed the dog in others. And when you do that, one day the dog in you is going to become friends with the dog in the other person, and then magic happens. That really was Gandhi's genius. 
irrespective of what you may think about his political activities, he had an incredible ability to bring out the best in large numbers of people. Contrast that to the politicians you have in the world today. But let's leave the field of national events, which is beyond the purview of my talk, and think about your life. Every day, in every interaction, you always have a choice. Am I feeding the dog, or am I feeding the wolf? And if you're conscious of that, and you consciously feed the dog in yourself, and you consciously try to identify and feed the dog in whoever you're interacting with, you'll find that both your lives are transformed. <clears throat> and here is a practical tip. Every time you feel overwhelmed, just stop and take 10 deep, slow breaths. Most of the time, we breathe in a very shallow manner, and every time you're in the grip of a strong emotion, anger, lust, hate, <clears throat> you're breathing very fast and using only the upper third of your thoracic cavity. Pause, take 10 deep, slow breaths. Breathe all the way into your abdomen, feel it expand, feel it contract as you breathe out. Take 10 deep, slow breaths, and you'll be surprised at how quickly you get centered. And when you're taking 10 deep, slow breaths, put your attention on your breath, follow it in, follow it out. Simple technique. And with that, I am done. Thank you very much for being a wonderful audience. And we still have time for questions. So, so um, let me just say, let me just say one thing to the sure. Audience, okay? Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> First off, we want to present you a gift. Oh, okay. And thank you for taking your time to be with us today. And oh. I also, I, I, go ahead, girls. Give this me, is give wonderful. It to the man. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> This is lovely, huh? <laughs> I've never had more charming people present me with a gift. Thank you. What's your Ella? name? Uh, my name's Ella. And your name? My name is Katka. Thank you very much, Alad Katka. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And I also, also want to note that we want to make sure that we get some Q&A in. So right. we're going we're to delay our break just a few minutes, uh, and we'll still give you a half-hour break. So with that interruption, please carry on. OK. Huh? Questions? <laughs> Hello, doctor. Yep. I have a question. Yes. Where I'm, are you? Huh? I'm, go I'm going to stand. Um, okay. So, the good thing, bad thing, who knows? We, we don't want to assign meaning to the bad things. We want to stay in the who knows, I guess. Mm -hmm. Is there any risk in assigning the good thing label? <laughs> I knew you would ask me a difficult question. <laughs> okay. When I give a public talk like this, I always talk about why it's not a good idea to assign the bad thing label. The good thing label also has a problem, but that's a little too difficult to get into in a short time like this, but I'm going to answer it briefly. The moment you assign either a good thing or a bad thing label, you're essentially living in duality. And the whole idea, the purpose of existence is to get beyond duality. So while immediately for most of us and most of the situations we say the problem is with putting the bad thing label, if you want to live a life of spiritual growth, 
It's a good thing to get beyond all labels. So don't use the good thing label either. It is what it is. OK? Does it make sense? Perfectly. And okay. it sounds like I need to enroll in your course to get the full details. Oh, it would be wonderful. And by the way, if any of you are interested, oh, I lost my thing. Let me put that screen back again if I can. Send me an email, and I'll be happy to send you the syllabus for my course. And regardless of whether you take it or not, you'll find the syllabus very instructive. Oops. Can we put my address back on this here, please? It'll come back somehow, huh? The last one. <laughs> I don't like looking at the back of my head as to what. More, more, more. <laughs> right at the end, yeah, I <laughs> keep going. <laughs> Next one. Yep, there. So there you have my email. Send me an email. I'll be happy to send you a copy of my syllabus. And that goes into greater detail on your question, OK? All right, anybody else? No other questions? Oh, one over there. So I want to thank you for these wonderful thoughts and uh, insights. But because we are here mostly educators, I am a teacher also, it's very important for me to say one thing. Um, what you're saying is very true for everybody of us who had a good enough childhood to become a, a, a healthy person. But we were also with children who have a very different childhood. Maybe some of our children have mothers who are, um, have a psychotic disorder, mm. or fathers or stepfathers who abuse them regularly, or they grow up in a very, very um, poor environment. So saying those things to people who have to grow up in this way is like, is very unfair because if you had to grow up um, and you could not really build up a structure to be a healthy human being, it's not possible to use your mind only because there are many memories in your body that come up and, and continue to come up regularly. Also for traumatized people this is true. So I, I just wanted to say this, it's, what you say is very true for healthy people, for people who had a good enough childhood, but we have to have a lot of understanding for people who did not have this good enough childhood. And we cannot judge, okay, you are not using your mind enough to control your thoughts and whatever. That's just what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you, yes, you're right. Uh, I would like to add one thing though which is, for my talk, think in terms of, is this relevant for me? And if you find it's relevant for you, then go right ahead and use it. And if you find it's not relevant for you, drop it. But if you're dealing with persons who are in the kind of situation that they did, that you described, there is one thing which is highly useful, and anybody can understand and benefit from this, and that is to recognize that a lot of what is going on in your head is just mental chatter. I'll give you an example. I had some teachers from a a program in New York, it's a prestige program, and basically dealt with uh, children who came from uh, uh, depressed neighborhoods, and many of them were into gangs, drugs, violence, and the teachers who came to my program came because the director had was known, of, had known about what I do and was a big fan, and he said, look, I want the teachers to understand so they can take it back to the classroom. So just imagine what would happen if you're in a gang situation, someone is angry, 
and he's about to reach for his gun or a knife, and he pauses just for a second to think, hey, I'm not really angry, it's just a thought that's going through my head. And if he could pause for just a second before his natural reaction, think of what a change it would make in his situation as well as society. So these concepts are universally applicable. Not everybody might be in a position to implement all of that. But some of the more important ones, and particularly the one on mental chatter, everybody can understand, and the applications are huge. Okay, so just bear that in mind. Any other questions? One other? Hi. Um, so there are many parts of your talk that really resonated with me. Um, and when you spoke about gratitude, um, that's a subject that I've been aware of for quite some time. And there are many people in the spiritual communities as well that, you know, advocate giving gratitude. And I think in a certain context, it can be very useful. But I think in other contexts, it can be a hindrance because it can actually lead to endurism, which can cause inaction where action should be taken. Mm. So my question is... Um, how does one stay aware of when you're using gratitude to stay in a situation that no longer serves you as opposed to enjoying the situations that do? Uh, not sure. Would you repeat your question, please? Uh, my question is, um, when, when using gratitude, how do we stop it being used as a, a way to stop someone making actions when they should. For example, if someone's in a bad relationship or in a bad job and they're focusing on all the things that are good about those situations, whereas they should actually move on into a situation that serves them better, um, where should you draw the line? When should you ensure that you're aware of why you're giving gratitude? Actually, what you're asking is the tip of a broader question. And the tip of the broader question is, how do we stop ourselves from being complacent if we accept anything that happens? You know, if this happened, I'm going to be grateful for that. And not, therefore, not only not reach our potential, but stop well short. And the short answer to that is, every single one of us has a vision of the world. This is the way the world should be. In our vision of the world, there's probably a starring role for ourselves. This is my role in this vision of the world I have. And as long as you have a vision of the world, it's incumbent upon you to do everything possible to achieve it. That's the key. As long as you have a vision of the world, it's incumbent upon you to do everything you can to achieve it. But if you succeed, wonderful. If you do not succeed, wonderful. And as long as you have that in mind and you strive with might and main to achieve it, but as you're striving with might and main to achieve it, you're still grateful that you have the opportunity to do it. You'll find that you don't become complacent, you'll continue striving, but in that striving is joy as opposed to, oh my God, why do I have to work so hard? That's something for you to discover. OK? All right, so thank you very much, and have a wonderful rest of today. Thank you.